Okay, so I think we can start now. Um, cool. Okay, so welcome everyone to the live session of two weeks refresher course in computer science on uh, next generation technologies sponsored by Ministry of Education. We have our keynote speaker, Ricardo Rocha. Ricardo is a, a computing engineer in the CERN cloud team focusing on containerized deployments, networking, and more recently machine learning platforms. He has pushed for several years the internal effort to transition services and workloads to use cloud native technologies, as well as dissemination and traffic and training efforts. Ricardo got CERN to join the CNCF and is a member of the CNCF uh, Technical Oversight Committee, TOC, and also leads the CNCF Research User Group. Prior to uh, this work, Ricardo helped develop uh, the grid computing infrastructure serving the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. On this note, uh, I request Ricardo to take over and I request the participants to post their questions in the YouTube chat box. We will take them in the end. Over to you, Ricardo, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Vipin. I will also share my screen quickly for the, for the presentation. Uh, let me just see. Can you see everything okay? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I'll just move this bars. Awesome. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, thanks, Vipin. Thanks, everyone, for, for attending. I'm very glad to to participate in this event. Um, it's been a while. It's been a while since uh, we last saw Vipin uh, here at CERN, but uh, but it's always a pleasure to to participate in these events. And uh, yeah, very glad. So as as Vipin mentioned, I, I work at CERN in CERN IT. I will be talking today a bit about um, uh, how we manage our infrastructure at CERN and a bit about the history of this infrastructure and then uh, look forward also to what's coming next and what's already happening now. But I hope everyone is okay. I'm still uh, doing a presentation from, from, from home, but hopefully slowly we'll get back uh, to, to, to a better place. So very quickly, Vipin already introduced, but uh, uh, I work in the CERN Cloud team. Uh, I focus mostly on Kubernetes and containers, but also networking and software-defined networking deployments. Uh, more recently, I've been focusing also on GPUs and other accelerators uh, for the for the, mostly for the purpose of machine learning uh, workloads. In the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, I am the representative of CERN in the end user community. community. Uh, I also joined the TOC, the Technical Oversight Committee, uh, earlier this year, where we try to to um, to help uh, with the with the ecosystem in the cloud native uh, area. And I also lead the CNCF Research Group, Research User Group. So that's uh, that's a group dedicated to to uh, making sure that all this um, ecosystem works well for research workloads that we will see are are a bit. Uh, uh, special if you compare to traditional IT uh, workloads, so we we just we we thought it was a good thing to to have a dedicated work group so that we get everyone together and also try to give feedback to the to the different projects. So uh, a bit about CERN for for uh, those that uh, don't uh, know or don't know a lot about its details. So CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. It was founded in 1954 and its main purpose is fundamental science. And what that means is uh, answering big questions like uh, what is 96% of the universe made of? What's dark matter? What's dark energy? Uh, what was the state of the matter just after the Big Bang? There's a, something called the quark-gluon plasma that we try to understand a bit better. Uh, and why don't we see antimatter uh, in the universe? Uh, we know that in theory, there should be the same amount of matter and antimatter, but we only see matter. So uh, we try to investigate that as well. Uh, in reality, to answer these questions, we build very large scientific experiments. So this is a picture of the, the biggest one we have, uh, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's a particle physics uh, uh, accelerator, uh, which is 27 kilometers in perimeter. Um, it's 100 meters underground, and uh, we accelerate uh, protons, two beams of protons, one clockwise, one counterclockwise, to very close to the speed of light. 
And when they are stable, we make them collide at very specific points uh, where we've built these very large experiments uh, uh, called CMS, Alice, uh, Atlas, and LHCD. These are very large detectors uh, where we try to see what happens in these collisions. Uh, to have an idea of the scale, you can see this is the, the CERN has two sides. This is the one in, in Mera, and this is the other one in, in Prevsa. And you can see the Geneva Airport for, for a notion of the scale and the Geneva Lake here on the right. So underneath, if you would go to the tunnel underground, uh, we have uh, the accelerator and its magnets in this case. So in the center, we would accelerate the proton beams. Uh, to get to these uh, high energies, we actually have to cool down the, the accelerator quite a bit to very close to the absolute zero, uh, 1.4 Kelvin, uh, and it's it's very often, we, we say it's the coolest place on earth uh, and it's literally the coolest place on earth. And then where we make these collisions, we have these very large detectors. Uh, these caverns are quite big. They can be, I think it's 40 meters by 40 meters. Um, the detectors are huge. Uh, you can see a human here to, for the idea of the scale. This detector is the compact muon solenoid, the CMS detector. Uh, it weighs 14 tons. And uh, the collisions happen in the center here, and the detector acts like a gigantic uh, camera. It's not an actual camera, but it acts like one, uh, taking something like 40 million pictures a second. And this allows us to try to track the, the results of the different collisions uh, to see what came out of them. Um, the, in reality, these this, this collisions generate, what, what we get from them is a huge amount of data. Uh, each of these detectors will generate uh, something like one petabyte of data every second. Uh, this is not something we can process. So what we do is we have this, what we call online filters that will uh, already reduce the amount of data to something like 10 gigabytes a second, which we can handle after. And this is what we have to store and later analyze. Uh, so this is just a visualization of one of these events, um, uh, just a 3D display. But uh, the end result, uh, at the end, all this work uh, is uh, towards building a, a plot. Uh, so this is a famous plot. Uh, this is the plot that showed the bump for, for the Higgs boson back in 2012 that gave the Nobel Prize in 2013. Uh, you can see in the plot, what you can see is like the blue parts are uh, what we know from the standard model of physics. Um, and then we have the red part, which is the, the proposed theory for a new particle in this case, for the Higgs boson in, a, in, the, in this uh, energy range. And then the, the black dots are the actual data, the, the things we saw from the collisions in the detector. Uh, and after analyzing them, we can, we can uh, plot them. We, we, we need a lot of data to have the confidence uh, level that we need to claim a, a discovery. But once we reach that, in this case, we could see the black dots following the, the theory and we could claim the discovery here. Uh, we have a couple of other experiments on site as well. Uh, one of them is the antimatter factory. Uh, this is just down the road from CERN IT. Um, we build antimatter to try to understand better its characteristics. Um, and then another experiment uh, is AMS. Uh, it's actually installed international, in the International Space Station. It was launched along the last mission of the Space Shuttle a few years ago already. And uh, it basically by being above the atmosphere, it can, it can do better analysis of things like cos cosmic rays. Uh, I mentioned a lot of data. So in reality, we are storing all the, all the, all these uh, gigabytes a second, which come up to, to a large amount of data. And this means that we need a lot of computing capacity to process and analyze that. So uh, we've built uh, what we have today is a very large uh, private cloud based on OpenStack. And you can see that it's uh, something like 300,000 cores. Uh, we have actually closer to 10,000 hypervisors today. Uh, more than 34,000 VMs. Uh, and even if you look at the number of projects and users, it's also quite impressive. So it's, it's a quite, for, for in terms of on-premises private deployments, it's, it's a very large deployment. And this is what we'll, the talk will we'll cover a bit how we manage the, this type of infrastructure. Now, the fact is that uh, even with this kind of deployment, we don't have enough capacity to process and analyze all this data. So over the last 20 years, or even a bit longer now, 
uh, we've built a system called uh, the grid, uh, the, the LHC computing grid. Um, and uh, what this is, is a, a, a network of something like 200 sites spread around the world that are connected together uh, with uh, high, high speed dedicated links between themselves. And that uh, basically allow centers around the world, like universities or big research labs that have quite a bit of computing capacity to share and to collaborate with us to, to offer it for, for the analysis of the LHC data. Um, so this, this um, allows us to more than double the capacity. We are close to 1 million cores uh, these days. Uh, the, the system has been in production since 2006, and it's really the, the, the core of the, the processing facility for, for, for the Large Hadron Collider data. Um, what we what we try to offer here is a, is a, a single uh, centralized system where users from different experiments can submit their jobs, and the system will will hide all the complexity of having this type type of distributed infrastructure. So it took, it took quite a long long time to develop it in the early two thousands, and this is pre cloud era era. So we were kind of by ourselves uh, with a couple of other scientific communities that also have uh, similar requirements. Uh, but but it's been in production and, and very efficient for, for quite a while now. So in total, we generate something like 70 petabytes a year with the current uh, detector, uh, current accelerator and the experiments we have. Uh, accumulated, we already have more than a half an exabyte of data stored. Now, the, the big challenge is that if we look at, uh, actually not so in so, so long, uh, if we look in the near future, uh, there will be a big you can see the amount of data require, uh, required for for uh, for the experiments and you can see that it starts ramping up very quickly in just a couple of years uh, because we will have an upgrade of this uh, the, the accelerator it's called the high luminosity uh, lhc and it's high luminosity basically because it it will generate a lot more data a lot more collisions a lot more data uh, so with this upgrade, we, are, we have to look at something like 10 times more data that we need to analyze. So we need to evolve the infrastructure to be able to process this while keeping a flat cost uh, with no more resources. So uh, it's always a challenge. It's not the first time we have to deal with this kind of ramp up. Uh, and that's why we keep looking at new technologies constantly. Now, going back, uh, in the in time to explain how things have been evolving and how we hope they will continue uh, evolving. Um, when every time we have this type of ramp up, we we always hope for some some breakthrough in terms of hardware or in terms of uh, automation and deployment or in terms of new completely new concepts that can can help with the dealing with this sort of uh, order of magnitude increase. Uh, if we look back in time in the 1970s, this is the exact building of the current data center. But you can see that in, at the time it, it looked very different. Um, it, it was more like a living area, a uh, working area more, uh, not really living area, but working area with the desks and the, some, some, some uh, closets. And then you can see on the back these mainframes. Uh, these were the main uh, processing facilities for, for, for the data at the time. Um, when I joined as a student, uh, now quite a while ago, uh, that we, we still had uh, one, one left, not this ones, but uh, uh, more recent one was still in the, in the data center. And then the big transition that happened here is that from mainframes, there was a move to commodity hardware. And the first version of that uh, type of installment uh, looked very much commodity in the sense that uh, we were just piling up uh, desktop machines in racks. Uh, these are desktops that look very much like the ones you would buy at home, which are uh, were cheap, but they were actually very inefficient. Um, so they didn't last very long in this type of layout in the data center. Uh, the power uh, consumption and the cooling uh, are quite inefficient. So it's not the best way to, to have a large amount of capacity deployed. But we did keep them for a couple of years. Uh, what you see here on the right are the, the tape uh, uh, um, systems. Uh, this is one characteristic uh, at CERN that is uh, sometimes surprising for people visiting, is that we still use magnetic tape. Uh, and this is the, our main uh, backup. So all the data goes into tape. Um, 
we used to use it uh, as uh, the first replica, but I, actually now we, we use it for, for backup. And if you come here, you will see a lot of uh, tape um, in the racks, in the, in the closet, and then the robot picking them up on request. But there are several reasons to use tape. One is that it's very cost effective because uh, the doesn't require a lot of pa uh, uh, power and it can store a, a large amount of data in a, in a small space. And they are also very reliable. We have some tapes that are more than 30 years old that are still uh, uh, usable. Now, of course, the transition to a more modern looking data center has happened uh, a while ago. Uh, this is how uh, pretty much how it looks today as well. Uh, we have this uh, traditional row and rack deployment. Uh, one characteristic is because this building has been adapted over time, you can see some tricks done, like this acrylic uh, uh, panels on top of the, the rows that basically will block the, the cold air from going upwards and force the force it to go through the through the machines. Uh, the deployments are using typical blade uh, servers. Uh, that you would see in any modern data center these days. I will also mention a very special computer uh, that we have on display here. Uh, this is the next machine that uh, Tim Berners-Lee used for the first web server. Uh, so one, one, another thing that CERN is famous for in, in terms of computing is uh, the, the creation of the World Wide Web by Tim, Tim Berners-Lee. This is the exact machine that, uh, that he was using in his office uh, as the first web server. There was then a second one in MIT across the ocean. Uh, there was also a sticker uh, here that is quite uh, funny, which said that this machine is a server, do not power it down. And this was his way of telling whoever would show up in the office, maybe to do some cleaning in the evening from not unplugging it to plug a vacuum cleaner or something similar and, and make sure it's running. Otherwise the web was down. Uh, this was back in 89 before it was given to the public domain in the early 90s. So a bit again, looking at the evolution of the infrastructure uh, um, uh, that we had and in general, in fact, um, what I will try to do here is uh, have uh, in the columns some ca characteristics of the infrastructure and uh, how they rate in these areas. And we'll start with the traditional physical de uh, infrastructure deployment. This means uh, you would just deploy your workloads directly on physical machines. And if you think about physical machines, uh, you can think that, uh, for example, provisioning of a, a physical machine can be quite long. Um, if you ask for a new machine, you probably have to open a ticket, then there will, some, there will be someone uh, that will uh, do some manual operations, maybe to connect to the proper networks, to make sure that the, the, you get the right machine and that it's connected to the, to the right network and any kind of uh, specific uh, setup that you might need in the machine. And then finally you get access to, to it, but uh, also the installation of the system has to be done um, in some way. So I put here days, it could be weeks in some cases uh, back in the times that we all, this is all, all we had. Uh, then the second item is maintenance. Um, if there was an issue with the uh, with the um, with the machine, say a faulty card. Basically, you have to bring the machine down, meaning that whatever workload is running there will be impacted. And so the, these operations are highly intrusive. Uh, the other uh, point would be deployment. Um, in this case, once you have access to to the nodes, uh, it's a very traditional uh, like Linux or Windows node where you connect, you do your deployment. So maybe it will take minutes. In some cases, if you're using some configuration tool, maybe it takes a bit longer. A couple of hours, uh, an hour or so, maybe. And the same is for update. And then the last column, which is uh, very important, is utilization. So if you're relying, all you can have is physical machines. This means that you're uh, allocating uh, full nodes to every single application. And even like applications that do not need a lot of capacity, it might be that all you have is large nodes and you end up allocating them. And it's not easy to share workloads uh, in this way. So the utilization ends up being quite poor. So um, a, the big breakthrough came with the virtualization and, uh, and then the cloud API. So I will start, the, the, the main one here is, uh, is the mix of the two. So uh, if you think of virtualization, it's the ability to isolate uh, multiple 
machines in practice in the same physical box, uh, running different kernels, so they are totally isolated. The user actually doesn't see uh, necessarily that, uh, that this is happening, and they don't see each other either in the same physical machine. But for provisioning, this is um, only half of the story. Uh, what we also need to improve provisioning is an API that allows us to interact with the system. So instead of having to open a ticket and having someone doing this for us, it's very important to have an API where you can create a server or destroy a server or create a storage volume, attach a sort of storage volume, this sort of operations that, uh, that the cloud kind of brought with this uh, notion of having this API-based interaction with the, with the infrastructure. So this, this was a huge breakthrough in terms of uh, provisioning. Um, you could now get a, a, a new node provisioned in minutes instead of having to wait days. Then in terms of maintenance, uh, I put here potentially less intrusive. There is the possibility once you have this virtualized infrastructure of uh, what's called live migrating the virtual machines from one physical node to another physical node. If this is supported and possible, uh, then the maintenance can be a lot less intrusive. You could evict the, the different machines from a physical node and move it to uh, and empty it so that you can do the, the maintenance and then put it back online once that's done. Uh, this is not always possible, so that's why I say potentially less intrusive, but there's definitely uh, the, the possibility of doing this, and we actually do this uh, daily uh, on a daily basis in our cloud. Deployment and update. Uh, you're still dealing with physical uh, with uh, with uh, machines, say Linux machines. Uh, one in one case physical, the other case virtual. But actually, the interaction with the machine is very similar. You probably will just SSH the box using root or some other account, and then the installation of the software and the management of the software is done in the same way. So this in this case it stays the same. And then the big jump here is also in the deutilization. Suddenly you can have multiple workloads. Uh, safely deployed in the same physical box, isolated, which means you can pack a lot more in the same amount of hardware and utilization obviously goes up. So the, the, for, for this type of infrastructure, if you're doing this on-premises, you need some sort of software that can manage this uh, cloud-based deployments. At CERN, we use uh, something called OpenStack. I, I understood that there was a earlier talk from Jonathan uh, about OpenStack as well. So we've been having, we've, we had it, this deployment since 2013 in production and it's been growing ever since. And it's now taking pretty much uh, the world deployment uh, in, in our own premises uh, infrastructure. Um, we deploy three different regions uh, in the same on-premises uh, deployment uh, infrastructure. And this is for scalability. Actually, there are some components in the control plane that don't scale very well to the size of our infrastructure. So we actually split uh, the, the, the deployment into multiple regions. And the main reason is to, to be able to scale independently, but also to do rolling upgrades. When we have to upgrade the underlying cloud uh, software, it's, it's always a very delicate um, operation as we have production workloads uh, there. So having multiple regions allows us to do it gradually and uh, to do it in the less relevant regions first and then slowly go to the more critical regions as we gain confidence with the upgrade. And then within the region, we also need to scale. So uh, we split the, the deployments into something called cells. Uh, and these cells basically match hardware deliveries. So the way we do it is imagine uh, we buy 200, 300 new physical servers. We pack them together. We do the network independent, set up independently for that, uh, that group of nodes. And then we put it in production as a, uh, as a group, as a new cell into the, the infrastructure. So it allows us to, have, to manage this as building blocks. It also allows us to have uh, um, an heterogeneous infrastructure. So maybe you have different components running in different cells, and maybe you have different types of hardware. Maybe you have like Intel and and others AMD, or in some cases you have only CPUs, in the other cases you have also GPUs. So this is a very nice way to split also the infrastructure. And then in terms of uh, hypervisors, we use KVM. We used to have a mixed uh, deployment with Hyper-V as well, but uh, for now, uh, right now we, we, we move to only KVM. So this is something that has been working uh, really well for us and it's in production for many years. Uh, this is the growth of the number of hypervisors. Uh, so you can see that we are close to 10,000. Um, and uh, this has been a mix of uh, like starting slow, 
and onboarding existing physical servers uh, gradually, but also new arrivals. You can see these big bumps with the like large amounts of hardware arriving that were put directly into the, the OpenStack infrastructure. Feel free to ask any question. Um, I'm happy to, to stop in the middle as well. Uh, this is a similar growth plot for the number of virtual machines. Uh, so we are close. We are actually passing the 30,000. This is an old plot, in fact. Uh, when, when you're managing this type of infrastructure, one thing that is uh, critical is to automate everything. Uh, once you start having tens of nodes, you probably start uh, suffering if you're not doing full automation. If you're having thousands of nodes, uh, you basically will never uh, get away with it unless you really automate everything. And this means automating the setup of the, the infrastructure. So this means the control plane and also the hypervisors running the virtual machines. Uh, and uh, we've been using a tool called Puppet to do configuration management um, across our infrastructure. Uh, but but it's not, not only the configuration and the deployment of the nodes, we also need to automate the tasks uh, that are required when you're running a large infrastructure like this. And this is things like uh, onboarding new users or creating new projects, managing quotas or allowing special capabilities for different projects. Uh, if we have to handle this manually, then the size of the team will have to be much bigger. We have a, limit, uh, a small team managing the whole uh, cloud infrastructure. So this means that we, with time, we've we've uh, we've enabled these uh, workflows that allow us to to also automate all these uh, these processes. So this is critical when you're running a large infrastructure. And then the last bit is to make the best use of uh, of um, of our cloud. Um, we always have some spare capacity because the, there will be new requests coming, uh, but, but we don't want to have that spare capacity idle. So we do things uh, like backfilling uh, with uh, traditional uh, batch uh, data analysis workloads. So when, when servers are idle, we deploy instances that will just do the data analysis, uh, automated data analysis. These instances are what's called preemptable, meaning that if there are higher priority uh, requests coming from end users, these instances will actually be killed. Uh, and uh, the capacity will be reclaimed by, by higher priority users. The other part that is quite, quite important is overcommit. So we mentioned that from physical to virtualized, we gained a lot by, by just having um, um, virtual machines in multiple virtual machines in the same physical box. This helps, but it's still we have cases where the virtual machines are still, uh, the claim for resources is still too high for the application running there which would end up with uh, uh, underutilized uh, physical resources. So in a lot of the, uh, in one chunk of the infrastructure, what we do is we overcommit resources, meaning we advertise more than we actually have, more cores. And this allows us to deploy more virtual machines that share the, the cores between themselves. And if they are not, if they are not all or a large fraction maximizing the usage to what they claim, um, then, then the system will work. And we kind of monitor when, when there is a workload that is actually meeting uh, uh, what they claim at the top. And if there are too many in the same node, then we try to move them around to, to make space. But this, is, this has been working really well for us. Uh, then uh, around 2015, 16, we started looking at containers again. Uh, because we have this uh, evolving requirements constantly, we are also constantly looking at new technologies. Uh, and the one that came up uh, more recently is this idea of running workloads in containers instead of using uh, uh, machines. Um, and this, this uh, coming back to, to the, this uh, column-based uh, um, analysis, uh, we can see that uh, if you've used containers, uh, the, the provisioning of a container or the deployment of container, it, it, it's actually in seconds. Uh, so we don't have this boot time anymore, a different kernel. So we can actually spawn these workloads really, really fast. This has a dramatic uh, impact in terms of the management of the application. You can do uh, large uh, up upgrades across a very large infrastructure in, in seconds, uh, which kind of uh, changes uh, a bit the way we, we manage the application deployments. And then uh, another another thing that comes with containers, if you're using an orchestration engine like Kubernetes, is that you are actually 
not deploying the application, you're declaring how your application should look like. And this is in terms of the number of replicas that should be running, what type of affinity or anti-affinity you have between the replicas uh, and the association with other services that might be running in the same infrastructure as well. And what this allows is the orchestrator to, to make a much more informed decision in terms of where the workload should be running. So if you have three replicas uh, running across availability zones and you need some intervention in one of the availability zones, then the, the orchestration, the orchestrator can make a decision by itself. Okay, this area is down or will be down. I can coordinate this and, and move the workloads to, to another area to keep the, the, the desired number of replicas up and running. So this is, uh, makes it less intrusive because the, you don't really need to know uh, or announce the, the, the interventions to the end users. You can just uh, trust that the orchestrator will, will do that job. And then deployment and update, this is also something that changed quite a, quite, quite a lot. Uh, the, the, um, the deployment we just mentioned, because you don't have the kernel is much faster, but also the update, uh, the orchestrator will try to reconcile the desired state to the actual state. And it does this much faster than the traditional configuration management tools. And finally, utilization. So we had a big jump from physical to virtualized infrastructure. We have a, uh, another jump smaller but another jump from into containers and the main reason here is that uh, while with virtual machines we are actually isolating using different kernels um, in containers we are isolating using kernel constructs like c groups and or namespaces and what this means is that uh, uh, we can we only run one kernel uh, and we reclaim a lot of the memory that is being used if you have multiple kernels so uh, that, that's something that is very relevant when you have a very large infrastructure. If you're reclaiming just a couple of gigabytes here and there, if you have thousands of nodes, then you're reclaiming a lot of memory. So for, for this containerized deployment, uh, we rely on Kubernetes mostly, or pretty much uh, everywhere these days. Um, uh, it's, it's becoming, or it became the lingua franca of the cloud. Um, if you go to all the major public cloud providers, you will see that they have managed uh, Kubernetes uh, services uh, offered, uh, which means simplifies a lot your, your, your job. You don't have to manage the infrastructure. You just have to use the Kubernetes APIs and talk to the endpoints. Um, there are also other options if you're running a non-premises infrastructure like we do. Uh, in our case, we use OpenStack. So we rely on a tool called OpenStack Mag Magnum, which is the, the tool that manages uh, Container uh, containers in, in OpenStack and container orchestrators. You have other options like op OpenShift or Rancher or even KubeADM if you want to go low, low, lower level. This API uh, allows us to abstract compute storage and networking and do this declaration of uh, the requirements for each application. But actually, it's much more than that. It became it can manage any type of resource. So there there are uh, extensions and even built-in constructs to manage a lot more than just these basic constructs. Um, so you, you can manage a database using Kubernetes, you can manage a, a, a Redis instance. There, there's a lot of uh, uh, like higher level constructs that allow you to, to rely on the control plane uh, of Kubernetes to manage other tools. Now, the, the other big benefit is that with Kubernetes comes uh, a lot of good, come uh, got a lot of goodies in the ecosystem. So we are talking about deploying and manage the, the resources themselves, but actually when you're running a service, there are other uh, points that are very important. For example, how you monitor your service or how you collect the logs or how you collect the metrics of your service. This is, uh, if you would traditionally in our infrastructure, we would use Puppet to configure and then maybe use CollectD or Flume to, to analyze logs and collect the metrics. Um, in, in the Kubernetes world, this is kind of all, um, connected in this cloud native uh, ecosystem where the tools uh, are, are built so that they can talk to, to themselves quite easily. So for example, for monitoring, uh, there is a tool called Prometheus that also defines a, a, a way to expose the metrics. And most of the tools and the applications in this ecosystem will export those metrics in this format. And then there's a standard way for Prometheus to, to go and query them. So everything comes kind of built in 
uh, and you, you can expect them to integrate very well. And the same is true for logging. I put here Fluent D, there's also Fluent Bit, but the, the way the logs are exposed from, from the containers and aggregated and then pushed centrally is also um, uh, well-defined. And there's a lot of other tools. So I mentioned here some, but uh, if you go to, to this URL on the bottom, you can see uh, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape growing uh, very fast. And yeah, any area you think of, you, you, can, you can go and, and find uh, tools to, to try to help with that. Uh, there are different levels of, uh, of uh, maturity. The biggest being graduation, then you have incubation and also sandbox for entry-level projects. Um, this is a nice way to, to, to also assess what's the, the state of the project if you are uh, thinking of deploying it in your production uh, infrastructure. Uh, so at CERN, we have more than 600 Kubernetes cl uh, clusters running. Uh, 600 of them are Kubernetes. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Docker Swarm, sorry, Docker Swarm clusters that are kind of legacy. Uh, we have a significant amount of nodes deployed. So we have uh, tens of thousands of cores running on Kubernetes. And uh, we've seen that this is gradually increasing. Uh, we offer a nice way to have a Kubernetes endpoint so people uh, are jumping in. Now, all this automation is very nice and Kubernetes does a very good job about doing this. There's one uh, area that is still needs attention which is uh, your actual configuration. So we were, we were saying that uh, your, your application definition is done in a declarative way, uh, like it or not in YAML files, uh, in the case of Kubernetes. Um, this is a very nice way to describe how your application should look, but then there's the problem of ch managing the changes in the evolution of these configurations. Maybe you have multiple uh, flavors of your deployment of the same application, with different configurations, you need some way to, to manage this. You can do this uh, just by keeping some files locally and pushing them manually, that works, but it's not the best way to do it. So one pattern that uh, has been uh, quite popular is this idea of doing GitOps, which is to uh, version control the configuration data in the same way you version control your code so that you can track the changes and the evolution of this configuration and the deployments. And then to have a tool that is running in the cluster that monitors this, uh, this configuration. And whenever you do a change, it will pull the configuration and apply it locally in one or more clusters. You could have multiple clusters pulling the same configuration in case you want to spread the deployments. So this is, this is a very popular and a really, really nice way to, to manage large infrastructures. Um, it's pretty much the, the way everyone is trying to, to, to manage the configurations these days. Uh, other ways is to, to do a more like a, a push uh, on some, some, some kind of CI CD kind of deployment. But this, this idea of uh, also having a tool that uh, pulls um, also kind of uh, uh, abstracts the deployments, the details from, from the, the repository, you can, you can kind of uh, detangle them one from the other. So there are tools that are uh, useful for this. One is Flux, the other one is Argo CD. Uh, they are both uh, quite efficient at doing this kind of uh, operation. Um, one thing that is also important here is to, uh, or relevant is to decide how you want to deploy your application. So the most popular, at least at start uh, way of deploying is you create one cluster, you deploy your application there and that's it. Um, this works. Um, you probably need to, some, to have some sort of high availability in the cluster so that you guarantee your application is always running, both for the control plane and also the distribution of the nodes across availability zones. Uh, the second option would be to have the same application deployed in multiple clusters. This will cover for uh, problems with the clusters themselves. If clusters go down the control plane, your application might become uh, inaccessible. So if you're doing multiple deployments, uh, you you, you kind of cover for that and you, you cover for a, like an improved blast radius. Um, it also allows you to do rolling upgrades. If you're upgrading the cluster itself, it's always a very delicate uh, operation that might break. So you can do this uh, cluster by cluster and uh, kind of maybe if it goes wrong, you get a degraded service, but it stays up. Uh, so this is also something to think about. There's this notion of having clusters as cattle 
the same way we had uh, VMs as cattle at, at the same time to kind of have multiple instances and if they are killed, your, your system can recover from it. There's this uh, idea of uh, having the same for full clusters uh, that allow you to, for example, drop a cluster and deploy a new one and uh, the, the application will just uh, spread in the new, new resources like this. And ideally, uh, you would uh, have multiple applications in multiple clusters. Uh, this is something like if you're managing OpenShift deployment, for example, this is the, the default. There are some more uh, implications here. You have to have very well-defined role-based access control if you want to run multiple uh, uh, applications and multi-tenant workloads in the same cluster. It's a bit trickier but it gives you a much better resource utilization. And the last part of the talk, I will go, I will, I've been talking mostly about on-premises deployments. Uh, what I will talk about is again, um, in, the, in this goal of always uh, making the best out of the available technology. Uh, one big thing that uh, came in the last few years uh, is the availability of public clouds that give you that this theoretically infinite capacity, on-demand capacity, where you can uh, go get it and pay as long as you use it and then destroy when you no longer need it, which is very tempting uh, for, for a lot of use cases. Um, the first one would be, for example, at CERN, we have periodic load spikes in the demand for capacity. So imagine we have a, a conference coming up and the, the physicists want to do a lot of extra data analysis uh, and then they need extra capacity. If we would uh, provision our infrastructure to those spikes, we would probably, for most of the time, uh, underutilize our, our, our infrastructure and that would be a waste. So the, ideally we should uh, provision for the, the, the normal usage and then try to go and, and fe fetch extra capacity externally and pay only for those uh, periods where we need, we need it. Um, the same is true for things like uh, GPUs. Uh, machine learning has been growing a lot uh, in usage at CERN, and uh, we don't have a lot of GPUs on premises yet. Um, so it's very tempting to go to the public clouds to, to get this extra capacity in accelerators, GPUs in this case. But also, if you're doing machine learning, especially deep learning, uh, there are uh, dedicated accelerators for that, uh, things like TPUs in Google Cloud or IPUs that are available via Azure. Uh, and this, um, this are dedicated accelerators that we might never be able to have them on premises and we might need to go to the public clouds to, to make use of them. So this is another motivation. And then the final one I mentioned here, for example, if we buy a new set of GPUs, you probably want to buy the best model for the types of workloads you're planning to run there. So to get, uh, it's very nice to go to public clouds and get a preview of all the nice uh, new hardware that is available test it there and then we can make a much better uh, decision of what we should buy in-house. The same is true for ARM, for example. There's some demand for ARM resources on premises that we don't have, but we can already start building packages for ARM by just uh, using public cloud resources. So to validate this idea that the public cloud is useful, uh, back in uh, 2019, we decided to, to to, to attempt to validate this, this idea that we could have a very large amount of resources for a short period, pay only for that, and then get rid of it and move on. Uh, the, for that, we, uh, for a conference, uh, KubeCon in 2019, we had a keynote where we had 20 minutes for the wall session, and we wanted to do a live demo where we would rediscover the Higgs that was uh, did the same analysis that uh, was done in 2012, to do it in, in a very short period that we could show it live uh, in, uh, during the keynote session. So the idea would be to take the 70 terabyte data set from the Higgs um, that had the Higgs events and then process it with enough capacity that it can be done in, in five minutes. The data set is 25,000 files. The software is quite old, but uh, it was only single core, which meant we could have maximum 25,000 cores in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cluster and then deploy 25 independent jobs, 25,000 independent jobs, each processing an individual file in parallel. Uh, this, this would allow us to, to maybe do it in, in, in this short time. 
So what we did, we started by deploying this on-premises at CERN, and we were using the CERN S3 infrastructure, the, the Kubernetes infrastructure that I just mentioned earlier. Uh, but we had an issue, which is we didn't have the 25,000 cores for the demo because uh, we have a production infrastructure and, um, and no one would give us 25,000 cores just to, to do a demo. So we managed to do it with a, a lower number of cores, which allowed us to validate this deployment. And we did it in something like eight hours. Uh, but what, what, what is important here is that we based everything using uh, Kubernetes and a Kubernetes API. And uh, what we did then, we deployed a cluster in the Google Cloud, and we have a collaboration with the Google Cloud via CERN Open Lab. And this allowed us to, to just point the, the same deployment to the Google Cloud and, uh, and then run the, the, the same demo there, but with a much larger cluster. So in the end, it worked out. We, we actually reached a pretty impressive uh, data uh, throughput from, from Google Cloud Storage, 200 gigabytes a second, multi terabits a second. That was quite nice. Uh, just very quickly, this is the cluster creation takes five minutes for a 25,000 core cluster. Uh, the image pre-pool is a quite large container image, so that's why it's so slow. But the actual demo was these two steps where we pull the data and then uh, process the data, and this took just over five minutes. And this is just a view of it. Uh, we were building the plot, the same one we saw initially in the talk. We were building it live as the data was being analyzed. Uh, I will finish just with machine learning workloads. This is where the public cloud has been uh, really relevant. Um, one, one big thing is that physicists are not necessarily computing or infrastructure ex experts. So they will be very good at getting stuff done, but maybe for machine learning, they will have one node with one GPU or a couple of GPUs, and they, these GPUs will be spread. So they, they will be underutilized. And even if, uh, if uh, people would like to scale further, uh, they would be very limited if, if their workloads can only run uh, in one node. So having this kind of distributed infrastructure for, for machine learning is also very tempting and offering a centralized service for machine learning was also very tempting. Uh, there is a big difference from the traditional help workloads. I mentioned that we had the Higgs data set uh, 25,000 files and we can actually process them totally independent. So we call this embarrassingly parallel. You can deploy jobs in parallel and they, are, they don't have to talk to each other to get the results. But for machine learning, this is not always the case. Very often you, during the training, you need more communication between the, the different jobs. So we use, uh, we've been looking at a platform called Kubeflow, which runs on top of Kubernetes. Um, and this is uh, really trying to answer all the, the needs we have, which is to manage the distributed training, to manage the infrastructure and the deployment of the workloads and the coordination between the workloads. And this would allow us to do distributed training at scale with the tens, hundreds, thousands of GPUs even. Um, it supports all the popular machine learning fr frameworks. And it also offers additional functionality for things like notebooks for iteration when you're uh, playing with your training initially. Um, and then it also serves the modules, models. And uh, one thing that is very important is this uh, hyperparameter tuning. If you've tried this, you know that this is a uh, time consuming and very uh, resource intensive. So it automates this, uh, this process as well. So we've been uh, looking at uh, using public clouds for this because we need a, a, a large amount of GPUs. Eventually we'll also have this capacity on premises. Uh, so here I would like to highlight that it's very important to be flexible for us, at least, it's very portable to be flexible in how we can use the public clouds. And again, the Kubernetes API is a big plus here. So the idea is that the CERN services can burst to different public clouds, supporting all the public clouds uh, via the Kubernetes API. And even within one public cloud, being able to easily use multiple regions. The reason for that is that capacity can vary from one region to the, to the other. So it's very nice to, to be flexible in this way. And uh, just as an example, so we, if we take one, one example, which is uh, 3D GANs uh, for uh, fast simulation. So to generate simulation data, we are also looking at uh, using machine learning. And initially, uh, one epoch of this training uh, would take 3,500 uh, 3, uh, seconds. And uh, using the public cloud and this infrastructure based on Kubernetes and Kubeflow, we actually managed to scale this to using 128 GPUs in parallel 
and we got almost linear scale. So we got a hundred times improvement. And this is the sort of uh, breakthrough we need to be able to deal with the increase of data that is coming up. This is a very, very interesting result. Uh, we also did, uh, so you can see here the, the um, evolution of the scale uh, with the number of GPUs. The other interesting result is uh, the usage of TPUs and dedicated um, accelerators. Uh, you can see that um, we get uh, similar results in terms of uh, TPUs, for example, TPU V3 with 32 cores to get a similar result uh, as the GPUs, as 32 GPUs. Now, the, the big thing about TPUs and that makes them interesting is that uh, they are much more cost effective than GPUs. Uh, one, one thing that I would highlight is that while, because this workload linearly scales, actually we can scale and get a uh, hundred times improvement while spending the same amount of money. So this is really a big plus is to optimize the training so that you can get close to this sort of uh, scale um, scaling so that it remains cost effective to, to do it uh, with a much larger amount of resource. And then the second thing is that if you look at the TPU costs, they are really at uh, like two and a half times cheaper than GPUs, which makes it really interesting uh, as a potential uh, future resource to, to use at scale. So I come to the conclusions. Um, I would uh, highlight, I think it was clear that uh, uh, this type of experiments and uh, at CERN and elsewhere, they generate a large amount of data, uh, which implies that we need a lot of computing power to process this. Uh, and what is sure is that these numbers will never stop increasing. Uh, we will have a 10 times bump very soon. We can trust that in 10, 20 years, the same will happen again. Uh, the big change that happened from, say, 20 years ago is that we used to be by ourselves, this, this type of scientific experiments, and no, no one else had this sort of scale in terms of the amount of data. This is no longer true. There's a lot of uh, companies uh, in, in the industry area that have similar or much higher requirements, and this triggered the creation of these open source communities that try to collaborate to build infrastructure tools that can scale to this size. Um, and this is a, a huge change for us because instead of having to build our own tools in-house, we are now collaborating with these communities and uh, trying to like um, help with the development, but also validating our use case. And this um, this makes it uh, much better uh, in, like for us because we can focus more on the higher level parts than just having to focus on the on the lower la layers. And these communities are very vibrant and, and active. So it's, it's also very exciting to, to collaborate. Um, and then the third thing is that uh, it's quite important to stay flexible, to not uh, lock, you, lock to a uh, particular technology. We need to be able to transition as new technologies and new, new types of uh, uh, software to manage infrastructure at scale show up, we need to be agile enough to, to transition to these new ones so that we don't lose the, the train and we can keep up with the demands from our physicists. And that's all I have. And I'm very happy to answer any question. Thanks, thanks Ricardo. And uh, I remember a few years back, I was in CERN then it was around 100K course and now it's like, one million course, so you are increasing like crazy. And thanks, thanks for sharing this shift from physical infra to cloud APIs and now to containers. And uh, and thanks for telling us how important these containers nowadays are. And uh, we have some questions here. Uh, one question is, uh, as you said, that underlay you are using Kubernetes, but uh, but what kind of deployments from this we can assume that CERN has? Like, is it OOK, OpenStack on Kubernetes, or OOO? What kind of deployment you generally use as overall architecture, if I ask? Right. So that, that's a good question. So uh, we basically, it, it's this idea of staying agile also comes from in, in this uh, application. So basically, we manage the, the lower level cloud using OpenStack. Uh, we manage the infrastructure using OpenStack and we actually deploy Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. So by default, the Kubernetes clusters will be using virtual machines and those virtual machines are managed by OpenStack. And then we have this tool that basically orchestrates uh, the deployment of the different components to have the master and the different worker nodes and to allow things like node groups uh, on the Kubernetes cluster. Um, we support also the ability to um, 
to have Kubernetes clusters running on virtual machines, but also on bare metal. You can have bare metal nodes in your in your Kubernetes cluster. But even in this case, we still rely on the OpenStack API to, to manage the nodes themselves. There's a project called Ironic that allows you to deploy uh, physical nodes on OpenStack. So this is, uh, this is like stacking the layers. Um, um, there, there are deployments where you could probably just, uh, if, you, if you don't have use cases that would require virtual machines, you probably could just get away with simply Kubernetes, but you need the tooling to, to manage the, the deployment of uh, the management of the physical nodes. Um, the, the, second, the second thing that I will mention is actually because uh, deploying applications of, on Kubernetes is, is so nice and easy, we actually starting to, to do uh, the other way as well, which is we deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack, but actually the control plane of OpenStack, a fraction of it is running on Kubernetes itself because it allows us to manage the upgrades uh, much more easily. So we always keep some of the control plane in physical machines in case everything goes down, but actually a fraction of the control plane is now also running on Kubernetes. Yeah, and also uh, for hybrid cloud as well, like as you said, you're like using GCP to Azure to, to AWS. So, so um, if you can tell us more in terms of not that much big infra, but let's suppose in, in a university, if we have a, let's suppose small infra in that case, also, if we want to use such kind of, uh, uh, such kind of uh, things like as for the hybrid cloud. So uh, what do you suggest, like what kind of deployment is good? Like, is it uh, like, as you've written in this, uh, in this slide, Kubernetes has the underlay, right? So, so is it necessary that always Kubernetes should be as underlay, or it can? No. What do you suggest? Yeah. So no, no. This this is the the last uh, version of uh, of our deployment. Uh, we've had experiences with the public cloud in the past uh, using other sorts of uh, interfaces. Um, there was an idea to, at some point to have uh, uh, OpenStack APIs on top of the public clouds that didn't really fly very well. Uh, then we moved to managing virtual machines um, uh, on the public clouds. And this is quite easy if you're using a tool like Terraform to just burst your capacity to, to virtual machines on the public cloud. The issue is, with that is that, uh, again, I come back to Kubernetes being an API, but being a declarative API. Um, what, what Kubernetes can do in terms of, for example, if you define a workload uh, with, uh, with auto-scaling, uh, which is what we want to do. Like in, in this picture, all these node groups are auto-scaling with size zero. So they are always there, but they, we only have nodes, actual nodes when the, the capacity is, is required. And we will delete those nodes as soon as the, they become idle for, for a short period. Um, and this automation is really coming from Kubernetes because we define the workloads in this declarative way. Um, the Kubernetes will take care of uh, scaling the number of replicas of the workloads, but also scaling the clusters themselves and going to fetch new nodes uh, when, when they are needed. They, it will scale the individual node groups when the, the capacity is required. If you're doing this at a vir virtual machine level, uh, you have to put this logic in your deployment. Uh, you, you can just, you, you need some tooling that will, will do this job. Uh, and this is where Kubernetes also shines. It's not only that you have this API that you can pass your declaration to, to the public cloud in the same way you do on premises, but then the, the orchestrator, in this case, Kubernetes will actually take care of uh, um, provisioning the infrastructure automatically for you. Uh, it's a higher level than than having to rely on virtual machines. So this is, I would say, this is this is one of the big pluses of uh, relying on a Kubernetes API. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. And although we have more questions, but uh, due to time constraints, uh, we can't take now. But uh, of uh, uh, we can ask you offline. If participants have more questions, they can ask in the discussion forum as well, and we can pass it to the Ricardo. Absolutely. And, uh, on behalf of the organizing team, Open Technology Foundation, Frost, and Teaching Learning Center, Ramanujan College, University of Delhi, we extend our heartfelt thanks to you, Ricardo, for taking out time and interacting with our participants. We really hope that to have more engagements with you in the near future. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah.